There are new concerns this morning over the spread of avian flu after the death of a house cat in the U.S. The cat was infected from eating raw pet food from a producer in Oregon. So how concerned should we be for our pets and what is the risk to humans? For more on all this, we're joined by Dr. Christopher Labos, an epidemiologist and cardiologist this morning joining us from Montreal. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, so it certainly sounds concerning here, especially when we hear about the recall of some pet foods linked to bird flu, but how concerned should pet owners be about the risk to their pets? I mean, I think the risk to any individual pet is probably still low. What is concerning about this virus, especially what we've been seeing in the past few months about avian influenza infecting dairy cows and now cats and, and, and other types of felines, is that the easier it becomes for this virus to infect other types of animals, especially mammals, the easier it will ultimately become for this virus to infect humans and to spread amongst humans. Now, we're not at that point yet, but any individual story about this virus gaining the ability to infect other types of animals is going to be a little bit concerning concerning because it's inching us towards the situation where it much become much more common in humans, even though the risk right now is actually quite low and probably will remain low for, for some time to come. Well, and you talked already about how it's impacting kind of cats and bigger cats. Uh, we have some pictures that we can show everybody of some of the, the big cats who died from the bird flu in Washington at a wildlife sanctuary. Um, so, but what do we know about what's driving all these cases right now? Well, a lot of what's being, so there's actually a few different factors that are driving this. A, a lot of this is the migration of wild birds, right? And that's what makes bird flu, avian influenza so difficult to control, is that because wild birds can cross international boundaries and there's no very easy way to control their movement. What's happening in the US though is actually a little bit specific because it has infected dairy cattle a lot of the early cases there were actually linked to people who were working with the cows, people who were drinking raw milk. And so one of the factors that goes beyond this, apart from the normal occupational exposure of people who work on bird farms who might come in contact with wild birds, it's also the people who are handling the raw products from these farms, so drinking raw milk, eating raw cat food, as is the case in the U.S. showed, that is potentially problematic and has just sort of underscored the importance of pasteurization and proper food handling. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should always be concerned about food poisoning and you should always cook and handle your, your food properly because a very large number of people develop food poisoning every year, especially around the holidays. But the introduction of avian influenza has just added one extra factor and one extra dimension to that discussion about why you shouldn't be drinking raw milk. One, well, as you point out, it's certainly working its way up the food chain, that teen in BC in critical condition, and then that patient in Louisiana as well. Um, how concerned are you, though, at this point, that it will start transmitting between humans? So I, I am, I, look, that, that probably will happen. The question is when, is it gonna happen this year? Probably not. Is it going to happen within the next five to 10 years? It, it is possible. Is it going to happen at some point within the next century? I think that's probably statistically likely. So viruses are always going to change and adapt and they are always going to get better at infecting their potential hosts. The, the issue is going to become if we start to see that happening, are we going to be able to do something about it? Are we going to be able to handle it? Are we going to have enough of a a pandemic preparedness plan in, in place? Are we gonna have the vaccines ready? Are we gonna have a stockpile of medication? Are we gonna have an adequate supply of PPE so we're not caught on the back foot as we were when COVID first entered the scene? So yes, I am concerned, although I don't think that's gonna happen in the short term, but you know, it's very hard to predict how viruses are going to behave. We don't know what the future holds. We can only plan for the worst, but hope for the best. I want to pick up on one of the points that you just made there about vaccines. Where are we at in terms of a vaccine against avian flu? So avian influenza is not a new virus, right? We've had outbreaks of avian influenza over the past 20 years. We've had outbreaks in Canada before, but they've been self-limited because the virus doesn't typically spread between humans very easily. Most of the people who, who get sick, including most likely the quarantine, probably contacted it from the environment, from wild birds. And the cases in the US were largely occupational exposures, people who were working on farms. 
So we do have a vaccine in place. It's just that we've never actually had to use it or roll it out because the number of cases has been too low for it to, to make any real difference. Interestingly enough, in Finland, they actually have started giving the avian influenza vaccine to high-risk individuals, meaning oh. people who work on bird farms. So we could, in theory, do it if the number of cases started to go up. It's just that right now, one single human case in Canada probably doesn't justify the expense to go out and do it. But if we started to see more cases, then, yeah, that is something we could do uh, because th th we do have this vaccine available. We just have to manufacture it and, and roll it out. And that is the easy part of vaccine development. It's the, you know, developing it the first time around that is always a little bit more difficult. Yeah, as we saw with COVID. All right, doctor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. You take care. Dr. Christopher Labos joining us. And I am Chris Glover. You're watching CBC Morning Live.